Um, let's dive in this morning. Chapter 12, uh, verse 12 is where we're going to start. The next day, the large crowd that had come to feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So uh, let's pause there to kind of get understand where we are. Um, last week, we were, Jesus was in Bethany. Mary took this perfume, put it over Jesus' feet or ointment, and she rubbed him with her hair, most likely put it on his head as well. Um, but that was a Saturday. Now we're moving into a day most of us know as Palm Sunday. So this is a Sunday before uh, Jesus dies. All right, so you got to think, you know, at this moment, we keep, I keep saying this every single week, but we are literally days away from Jesus' death at this point. I mean, on Friday, he's going to be hanging on a cross to die. Next Sunday, where we are in this text, he will be risen from the grave alive. And so you kind of get in context of where we are inside of Jesus' life. We're in the final few days, final few days of his life. All right, so like I said, it's commonly known as Palm Sunday. Um, let's keep reading. I'm going to read verse 13 again. And then we're going to read down to verse 19. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. The disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So I want to paint a picture kind of what's going on. We actually studied this text, some of you guys remember this, way back in, uh, on Palm Sunday, actually, this year. And so, um, some of you there, some of you were not, and I'm really going to kind of give a, a brief overview of what's going on. We're going to dive into, I think, the last half of this passage this morning is really what I want to focus on. But um, when you read this picture, like, how many of you guys seen Lord of the Rings? The last one, anyways. Return of the King? You guys seen that? Okay. I was in this high school. I love these movies. Um, but the last scene, and you might, if you haven't seen Lord of the Rings, I know you've seen some movie where uh, a, the, the king rides in on a horse, kind of one of these medieval movies, or uh, even like, I think we talked with, uh, Patrice about this uh, previously, you might think of like the Patriots riding in for victory. You know, they won the Super Bowl, so they ride into Boston and victorious. So, uh, but Lord of the Rings, I, I just think about, you know, you got Aragon, you know, he's the king, they, he rides in into the city, white horse, everyone's cheering, everyone's excited, people are bowing down, throwing things in the air in celebration. Like, that's kind of the idea of what's going on here. That basically, the enemy has been conquered, and now rides in victorious king. Right? The king has come. And this is exactly what's happening here. The crowd, they're recognizing what's happening. They're grabbing palm branches, which in that uh, context, in, in first century Israel, palm branches were a sign of victory. So they're laying them down, waving them in the air. This is a sign that victory has come. Like it, it, he's, he's a, the conquering king. And they're even crying out. You notice they're crying out, Hosanna, which is a really strange word. Which is like, it's, I don't think I've ever heard anyone use Hosanna ever in context. I've never heard anybody use this word. It's a Hebrew word that really even in that time wasn't commonly used. Because it's just a, it's a very strange word, but what it comes from is Psalms 118. It's, a, it's in the Old Testament. And what it means is, Lord save us. So they're crying out, Hosanna, Lord save us. And then it's followed by in verse 13, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Like, save us, Lord, and here is the one that's going to save us. It's our king. It's Jesus. So at this point, they're recognizing Jesus is their king. They recognize that, that, that Jesus is the one sent by God to save them. And everyone is going to him. In verse 19, you notice it's the Pharisees. They're like saying, look, the world has gone after him. This is obviously not literal, not entire world, but but. Basically, it's saying everyone is going to Jesus at this point. Everyone's running towards him. We've kind of lost our control. Jesus is now 
seen as king by the majority. But when it ended, the next few verses, I want to read these next couple of verses, because you actually start to see the world start coming to Jesus. Verse 20 and verse 22. So now among those who went to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and, said, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So you, you kind of see the Pharisees, they're saying the world is going after him because literally nationalities, different contexts are now going to Jesus. Not just the Jews, the Greeks, the Gentiles are now coming to Jesus. They want to worship him. They want to, they, they want to worship the king of Israel. Now this is actually truly amazing because it's, it's literally fulfilling scripture before their eyes. Uh, if you look back at the Abrahamic covenant, back in Genesis, um, it's chapter 11, I'm going to be wrong on that, but it's the very beginning of Genesis, <coughs> 12, I don't know, anyways, Genesis, um, where God promised Abraham that a descendant would come from the line of him. From the line of Abraham, a descendant would come from Israel that would bless the entire world. And now you're, you're looking in the world now, quotation marks, but like the world around that context in Jerusalem is coming to Jesus. And now you can imagine the excitement of the followers at this point. Because probably things were going through their mind thinking, okay, now is the time of Israel's kingdom. Because it, they're thinking, okay, like now is the time where Israel is going to have their kingdom. The, now the, they're going to be the next empire. Now you've got to remember, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail in just a moment, but during this time of history, empires were a very big deal. Okay, you've already had the Babylonian Empire, you had the Persian Empire, you had the, uh, the, the Greek Empire with Alexander the Great, and now you had the Roman Empire. So many of the Jews at this point were thinking, it's our turn now. The Jewish Empire is now going to come. And here's our king. Here's our leader. He's coming into the city as king. He's going to take his throne. He's going to first kick out the Romans in Jerusalem. Then he's going to go to the surrounding nations. And eventually, there's going to be a Jewish Empire. This is what most of the Jews thought the Messiah would do. Okay? But look how Jesus responds. Verse 23. So this is, this, I'm going to show you, this is the thought that many people are having at this time with Jesus. In verse 23, Jesus says, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. It's time. And it starts out really good when Jesus says this. It's time for the Son of Man, who is Jesus, to be glorified. So all the people around are thinking, yes, it's time. He's going to take his throne. He's going to do what we've, what we've read in the Old Testament. He's going to do what he said he's going to do. Now, this phrase, Son of Man, I want to focus on this for a moment. It's going to really understand exactly what's going on and what's going through a Jewish mind at this point. We've already heard Jesus refer to himself multiple times in the book of John as a Son of Man, but we've never actually dove into the significance of this phrase, Son of Man, yet. And I've been kind of waiting for the right time to really kind of label out what this means that Jesus says, I'm the Son of Man. Because it's kind of a weird phrase for himself, right? Son of man. What does that mean? Like, what do you mean to see the son of man? But this phrase actually comes from, it's very important, it comes from a passage in Daniel chapter 7, right? Daniel chapter 7. And most of us know the book of Daniel, at least you know the stories in the book of Daniel, right? You got Daniel the lion's den, you got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you have the handwriting on the wall, or this weird hand appears, it's just right on the wall. Like, it, we know a lot of the stories in Daniel, but those stories are all in chapter 1 to 6, okay? They're all in the first half of the book. Most people never get into the second half of the book because it's very, very confusing. The second half of the book of Daniel, starting in chapter 7 um, to the end, it's focused on these visions and these, these dreams that Daniel is given to by God, all right? And Daniel literally, this is amazing about the second half of the book, and maybe it's the reason why most of us don't ever really teach on it, it's because it literally predicts the future. It predicts the coming empires in the world hundreds of years before they even occur. And, not, he don't, and Daniel doesn't just predict the future. He actually gives details of the countries, the empires that are going to come. 
He gives detail of the leaders of these empires. It's remarkable what Daniel cites in his book, in the last half. I mean, so it's so remarkable that most secular scholars actually hate this book. Because it, if anything, it proves that Daniel had to be given these, these visions by God. Because he literally predicts the future. There's no other way he would have known this stuff. And some, what most secular scholars try to do, which doesn't work, they try to date this book later than what it actually is. Because if it's dated later, then Daniel would have been just writing history instead of predicting the future. Just follow me? So this is, I'm not, I, I, we don't have time to get into every little detail of Daniel, but it's, I challenge you to go read it. When you read it, though, make sure you get like a commentary next to you because it is very confusing. Um, but it's a very remarkable thing when you start reading through it all. Um, but anyways, ch- in chapter 7, Daniel opens up. He sees four beasts. And this is, and this is all going to tie together in, in the end. Okay? He sees four beasts. And I'm not going to – I'm just going to clarify who these are, these, these beasts, very quickly because it's – we could, die, we could talk about this for hours. But there's four different beasts that Daniel sees. The first beast that rises up, there are different empires. Okay, the first empire is the Babylonian Empire. This is when Daniel was writing, he was in the Babylonian Empire. The Babylonian, they overthrew uh, Jerusalem years ago. Daniel was a Jew in captivity in Babylon. So uh, you had the Babylonian Empire. Second empire was the Persian Empire. Third empire would be the, the Greek Empire, said, led by Alexander the Great. Then, then the fourth and the greatest of them all was the Roman Empire. Okay, so, and, and he tells about these empires, how they're going to rise up. He tells their demise, how they're going to fall. But after seeing these visions of the beast, so he gets these visions. And then in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, he gets a new vision. And I want to read this for you because this is where the Son of Man comes from. <coughs> Daniel 7, verse 13 and 14, it reads, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancients of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So you see here the son of man, this is the only place it's mentioned. This is it. Until it comes out of Jesus' mouth. But the Son of Man, if you follow what it's saying in this passage, he is to be given all dominion. He is to be, give, to be given a kingdom. All glory is given to him. All peoples will serve him. Nations, languages will serve him. And his dominion, his rule, his empire will never pass away and never be destroyed. Okay? So, now see what's happening when Jesus says this. When he says in, in verse uh, 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Can you think of the excitement that's going through their minds? Because they, they understand the Son of Man from Daniel 7. They, they knew Daniel 7. They probably studied it. They knew the Messiah was going to come. They understood the four empires. They most likely knew the fourth empire was Rome, the great beast. Right? And, and the nations now are coming to serve Jesus. He's riding in as king. They're thinking, now is the time. He's going to take his reign. We've waited three and a half years for this to come. And Jesus has now come to become our eternal king. He's he's come. He's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to set up his Jewish empire. This is what they're thinking. But then you read the next verse. In a normal Jesus fashion, he's going to totally reign on their parade. Like they're thinking, this is it. We're We're going to have it. And then, uh, not so much. <laughs> totally what you're, you got, you're thinking of it all wrong. <laughs> verse 20, well, read verse 23 again. Let's read in <clears throat> verse uh, 33. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came down from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. 
Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So, understand, it's the entire picture. The entire crowd now is excited. Jesus had made the announcement. It's time for the son of David, the rightful heir to the throne, the, the Jewish throne, is going to take charge. And then he says, in essence, he's going to die. He's going to die. And you can think, like, what? The like whole crowd at this point, they're all excited, and all of a sudden, yeah, guys, I, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm going to leave you guys. Like, I, eventually, I'm going to be lifted up from the earth. The understanding is I am going to pass away. I am going to die. And the crowd understands this. Because listen to the response next in verse 34. They say, so the crowd answered him, we have heard from the law that, that the Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? They're thinking, wait, wait, wait. You're the Son of Man. You can't die. You are the Christ, right? You said you are. You, you claimed it. You just said you're the Son of Man. You can't die. The law, which means the Old Testament, has said that you are going to live forever. Your throne is going to be eternal. What do you mean you're going to die? What's going on there? They even ask the question, who is the Son of Man then? If you are the Son of Man, you're going to die. What's going on? They're just confused. And then Jesus gives one more statement, verse 35 and 36. So Jesus said to them, the light is among you for a little while longer. While, walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know what he, where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. The last thing he does Typical Jesus does, calls them to the light. He calls them to, to flee the darkness, which you guys are all in, and come follow me, and I will show you the path to eternal life. I will show you what this kingdom is all about. But you must reject the darkness and come to the light. Who is me? Now, the, the point of this text, one point I will, is, is there's many different points, and we can study many different areas in here, but... Basically, the main, one of the main points is Jesus is not the king they expected. They, he's not the king that the Jews wanted. This is why in a few days they reject him, they crucify him. He wasn't who they thought he was going to be. That's one of the main points in this text, and it's why it's, it's, it's kind of, uh, John is writing this, kind of draw out this whole narrative, right? He's a son of man. He's not who they thought they were going to be. So what do they do in a few days from now? They, re they reject Jesus as their king, and they say, crucify him. Let's just kill him. Let's end his life. But there is a theme here in this passage that I think is important to highlight. And I think this is the point I think Jesus is trying to get his followers to understand about his death. He's trying to get them to understand, like, when I die, something greater is going to happen. Like, you, you, you've read the prophecies, but you're missing the main thing. You're missing, like Isaiah 53, where it says, um, by my stripes you will be healed. Like it says that the lamb, the Messiah, will be led to the slaughter. You're missing some of the key points to the internal kingdom. You're missing it. So I believe what Jesus is trying to do in this text, he's trying to get them to understand this in some ways. Because in verse 28, notice what Jesus does. He cries out to the Father. He says, Father, glorify your name. He calls to the Father, glorify yourself. And then, Jesus, then God speaks back in his voice from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The Father said, I have already glorified myself. I've done it. Glorify myself. Look at creation. Look at us. Like, I have already glorified myself. It's there. It's evident. If you look in the book of Psalms, Psalms, Psalms 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Psalm 95, verse 3 and 5, for the Lord is great, is the great God. The great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountains peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. The sky, the mountain, the animals, our bodies, all of creation is pointing to a God that is deserving of all glory. Everything's pointing to God. But what does it mean when God says, I'm going to do it again? What does it mean, I'm going to do it again? And the answer is, it's through Jesus, right? That's why you see in verse 16, 
The disciples didn't, didn't understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered these things. It's all hinting toward this, this entire text. And Jesus says in verse 23, Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Then for, even in Daniel 7, when the prophecy of the Son of Man says, All glory will be given to the Son of Man. So what I want to do is I actually want to take two weeks and really explore this topic. It's how the Father glorifies his name. How the Father glorifies his name. And what I want is I want to look at two different angles here. This week is how we glorify God, and next week is how God glorifies himself. And they're going to be intertwined. They're going to be, it's very much it's, it's God glorifies himself through us. But first I want to focus on us. How do we glorify God? So I understand first is we were created to glorify Him. This is our perfect purpose of our existence. It's why we were created. If you look in the, uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, puts it like this: it, uh, the Catechism is a question and answer type thing. So a question is put out. It's basically what is the chief end of man? What is the purpose of man? But the answer is the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it is a man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's our chief end, it's our purpose. And if you look at a few verses here to state the case, this is our main purpose. Psalm 86, 9, All nations you have made shall come, worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. And a couple in 1 Corinthians make it very clear. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 6.20, for you were bought with a price to glorify God in your body. Clear through scripture. Our main purpose is to glorify God. Whatever we do, eat, drink, whatever we do in life, it is all a purpose to glorify God. Everything is an effort to bring glory to him. But the question is, how do we bring him glory? All right, that's the question. How, how do we do this? And this is where many, where many of us would ask, Where's the checklist? Right? What things do I got to do? What things do I need to check, checking off? We really focused on this last week where, where uh, we, we, touched, uh, we talked about Mary and, and Judas. Where Judas is kind of looking at the works he had to do. And Mary's looking at uh, just the fact that she just wanted to be with Jesus. And Jesus says to Judas at the end, the poor you always have, but you do not always have me. Giving the the, to the poor is good, but I have to be your focus. i got to be the thing you want more than anything else. And the point is that Judas is looking for a checklist, looking for the do's and don'ts. And I think many times in Christianity, what we're looking for is, okay, if I need to glorify God, how do I got to do it? Right? How, how do I glorify God? Well, you know, typical pastor is going to tell you, give. Right? Give, give generously. Start praying. Read your Bible. Serve in the church. Share the gospel. And if I do all these things, I'm glorifying God, which, yes, we should be doing all these things. These are good things. But the point that Jesus is making in this text this week, I believe, and also the one that he's making last week, is this is not the true core of the gospel. It's not, it's not due focused. So how do we bring glory to God? Look back at verse 24. Jesus says this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And Jesus first is talking about his life. Right? He gives this analogy, a grain of wheat, basically, if it's never planted, never bears any fruit. Think about a grain, like any, any seed. Right? If you leave it on a shelf, it's not going to grow anything, right? It's never going to grow. It's just going to sit there. It's, it's technically alive. I mean, seeds can, can last quite a while. But if it's never planted, it's never going to bear any fruit. But when you put a grain inside of the soil, it takes a different form. It actually kind of dies in a way because it takes a new form. And it, takes, and it starts to bear much more fruit. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying that, yes, I'm going to die, but you're not getting it. Like this, the Son of Man, the eternal kingdom, is going to come, but I have to die first. I've got to end this thing. I, gotta, I have to do this. So Jesus is saying, if you think about it, when Jesus was, when was Jesus glorified? As this text point out. Jesus was glorified in his death and resurrection. That's when he was glorified. That's what he's pointing to. And this entire analogy in verse 24 is pointing toward, toward, to that. 
And then what Jesus does in verse 25 and 26, this is where we, we come in. He turns it back on us. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me in where I am. There my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. <coughs> Verse 26, it says, if anyone sees me, he must follow me. Where are we following Jesus? Jesus is saying the way we follow him is to let go of our worldly life, to lose this life, to actually hate this life in order to gain a new life, an eternal life, a better life. So, Let's try to understand it, this whole concept of Jesus is saying. I'm going to put it in two different points. The chief end of man, the main purpose of life, right, is to glorify him and, and enjoy him forever. And by looking at Jesus' example, we have to follow him. So there's two main ways, right? If Jesus, how did Jesus glorify? How was Jesus glorified? In his death and his resurrection. So there's two ways that we glorify the Father. The first way we glorify the Father is through death. It's through death. Through Jesus' death meant redemption for all mankind. God's wrath was poured out on Jesus on our behalf. He died the death that we should have died. He paid the debt that we owed. He bore our punishment on that cross. But listen, though, as we see here in this text, Jesus is calling us to die as well to lose our life, to hate our life, in order to gain it for eternal life. But how do we do this? Romans 12, 1, I love this verse. I appeal to you, brothers. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, and by mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. This is your spiritual worship. The next, the next verse is, says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. You are to be a living sacrifice. Another verse in Galatians 5.24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have, 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 belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. <coughs> if you see the picture that Paul is painting here, he wrote both these verses. We are to be a living sacrifice, not conforming to the world. We are to crucify our passions and desires of the flesh, the sinful things in our life. And if you look at this language, sacrifice, crucifying, it's all pointing to Jesus. Right? We are to die to our worldly self. That's how you bring glory to God. You die to yourself. And now listen, we're not just dying to ourselves, we're not just dying to our sin, to our worldly desires. Like we, we need to do that. We need to die to our greed, our lust, selfishness, anger, addiction. You know? And I, 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 I could label all these different things, but you know the things in your life you need to die to. You really ask yourself, what is my sinful desire? What is the passion I need to crucify? But we don't just die to these things. Like we, we die to them as Jesus did. Jesus did. But as he says in verse 24, you die, but after you die, you bear much fruit. You gain life. And the next way we bring glory to God is through life. You die to yourself. Die to your sinful passions. Die to the, 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 the things in your life. And then you gain a new life. You gain a better life. A life that is better than anything you can find in this world. A life that brings glory to God. And this is like, once again, this is where we can do a checklist. What brings glory to God? But as I continue to say, that's not the point Jesus is making. The point is, we don't live the things for the world anymore. We don't find satisfaction in sin and desires of the flesh because we found something that is far greater than anything you can find in this world. Follow me on this. John Piper said something very similar to Westminster. And I love what, what Piper has said in this quote from his book, Desiring God. Some of you have heard, heard this before. But it so sums up everything. 
God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Both the Westminster and the Piper, and Piper what they're saying is that to bring glory to God is by enjoying him, to be satisfied in him. And this is so true. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there are fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Think about this. This is why it's so amazing. The, the, the gospel is so amazing. It's like you don't come to Jesus and get like an authoritative God. You, get, you come to Jesus and you get life. Like Jesus is the source of fullness of joy. He is the place to find the greatest pleasures ever known to man. He is, he is the, the best thing. And, and the thing is, is, he has made it known. It says in this passage, you have made known the path of life in Psalm 16. You have made known it. You have paved the path to have life. By your death and your resurrection, because you conquered sin, the sin that kept us from you, the sin that kept us from your joy, the sin that separated us from satisfaction. And he offers us forgiveness to all those who repent, to all those who die to our sin and gain a new life with Jesus. So listen, we glorify the Father by living life with Jesus. The one that died to give us life, to dying to our sin and living with him. And listen, it's living with him, not for him. It's very different here. It's with him, doing life with Christ, alongside him. Not thinking, I got to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, so I can glorify him. No, just do life with him. Everything else is going to flow from that. You're going to want to do good things. You're going to want to serve, right? But it first starts your relationship with Christ. I think for many times in Christianity, we've done this backwards. We've done it backwards. Constantly do, 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 instead of just, let's just love Jesus. Let's just be with him. This is exactly what Paul got this. Love, Philippians 1, 20 through 21. As, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but with full courage, now, as always, Christ would be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul didn't care if he lived or died. He didn't care. His life was dedicated to being with Jesus. And if he was going to be on earth, his life was focused on Christ. And if he would die, he's going to be far better because he's going to be with Jesus. This man, Paul, understood his life, his purpose was to glorify God by enjoying him, by being satisfied with him, by being with him. We could spend so much time on this topic, and, 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 but here's the thing. This is my prayer for this entire church and for myself this week. As I say many times, I, I don't just preach a message and don't actually apply it to my own life. I was looking at areas in my life where I'm not satisfied with Jesus. No, I'm, 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 I'm looking at other areas in my life where, where I am looking to things of this world to bring me satisfaction. I think we all can look at our life and see where those areas are. I was convicted this week. Like I'm, like, I'm, I'm looking to this and this and this and trying to find satisfaction, all these different things, but not looking to the source of joy. Not looking to him. I, and I, I was just in my mind just making a list of all these things that I choose in this world over Christ. And I was praying this week that God made that list burn. I made that list burn. I don't want to live that way anymore. May that, may my life now burn for Christ. Listen, revival is going to happen. I, I met with a guy this week and we're talking about this. It's going to happen through, through us glorifying God by being satisfied in Him. Being satisfied in Him. That's how you bring glory to Him. It's not this like, it's not this, it's, 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 dif it's difficult because we're sinful and we keep screwing up and keep trying to look at other things, but it's so simple. Like, 
if you knew the best thing in the world was over here, and you could get it, you could have it, why would you not go for it? Right? That's, that's the idea here. You have the best thing right here in your fingertips. Jesus says, come to me. I will give you everything you need. But we constantly look to other things, thinking, oh, well, maybe, maybe that might work. Maybe that might work. And God is over here thinking, I, I'm it. I'm the thing you're looking for. My prayer is for this church, and I, I, I pray that every single one of you go home, or even this moment where we're going we're to sing one more song, look at your life. Where are you looking for other things to satisfy you and not looking to the main source of joy and happiness? It's in Jesus. It's Him. You're not going to find anywhere else. My prayer is that this church will be a church that just loves Him. When we gather together and we open up God's Word, it's, it's just like, yes. We're together. We're reading His Word. And we're just in love with Jesus. That's what's going to change America. That's what's going to change Maine. Is that's what's going to do it. The church, I feel, is in slumber. Many churches around. And my prayer is that we will wake up. And it can't just be one church here just doing great things. Many churches, we've got to just wake up and just love Jesus for him. It's happening in other areas of the, country, other areas of the world. It's happening. But it's not happening here. And I think it's because we just are constantly looking to other things and not just focused on the source of joy, which is Jesus Christ. Let's bow and let's pray. Father, we love you. And God, I just thank you that you you provide a way for us to have joy, have satisfaction, to, to have you. This is something that they, they missed. This is something the Jews missed. They missed it totally. They thought you were coming to, to give them the worldly pleasures, not understanding you were giving them something that's internal, that's far, far better than anything they've ever had before. You were going to give them life. They rejected you. Well, I pray we don't reject you. Pray, God, that we will continue to just want to be with you. Pray this over my own life, God. I'm, I'm, I'm as sinful as any other person in this room, Lord. God, draw us to yourself. Do a work in every single one of our hearts, God. God, there are many people in this area that don't know you, Lord, that are far away from you. God, we have the gospel, but we're not sharing it. We're not spreading. We're not telling people about you because we're afraid, we're ashamed. Because we're honestly, I think the truth of it all is we're not satisfied in you. We're so blinded by all these things in this world, God. And I pray that you would just kill that stuff in our life, Lord. Help us to truly hate our sin to be a living sacrifice, to sacrifice these things, to crucify the passion, desires of our flesh, God. To crucify means to brutally murder those things, God. Help us to just get these things out of our life, God. And live a life 100% devoted towards you. We're going to continue to screw up, God. But God, you, you are a place to find forgiveness, to find true joy. God, may we glorify you. May we glorify you by being satisfied in you, Lord. We love you and we thank you for everything you do for us, Lord. And God, draw people to yourself. Even people that might not have a relationship with you right now, Lord. God, I pray you convict them of their sin. Help them today to die to themselves, but to look towards you and to have life, eternal life, true life, new life in you, Lord. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.